worship at Friendship. We're glad that you're here. We're praying God will use this time to speak to your heart and to bring us all forward as we seek to serve him better. You know, a tree that's planted by the water isn't phased by the fire. And so that should be with us as well. And the scripture reference for that that reminds us so importantly about how we're to serve is found in Psalm chapter 1, verse 3. The Bible says he is like a tree planted by streams of water which yield its fruit in season. We're praying that God will help us to yield our fruit as we serve him because it's found in you.
am a child of God. Yes, I am. Free at last, he has ransomed me. His grace was deep. While I was a slave to sin, Jesus died for me. Yes, he died for me. Who the Son sets free. Oh, it's free indeed. I'm a child. pray together. Father, we are so thankful as children of yours to know that we are forever children of yours. When we make mistakes, when we fumble the ball, when we don't move forward in the ways you have designed for us, we know that you still love us. You still are committed to us. You still offer us all that you are for our growth. And we are so thankful. We're going to make mistakes. We're going to hit a chug hole this week. We're going to make a wrong decision. We're going to make an insufficient choice. But we know that you're going to love us just as much. You're going to be faithful to us. And all that you ask of us is that we be faithful to you. For as you take us forward, we can count on it being the best choice we've ever made. Thank you, Father, for the way you love us. Thank you for the powerful name that changes everything when we claim the name of Jesus. For it's in his name we pray. Amen. You were the word at the beginning. One Your hidden glory in creation now revealed in you are Christ. What a beautiful name it is. What a beautiful name it is. The name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a 
Well, good morning. I hope you're doing well. If you have your Bibles, turn with me this morning to 1 John chapter 3. We're going to be looking at verses 4 through 10 together. Over the past couple of weeks, we've been talking about the second coming of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, this morning, we're going to be talking about um, how we are to live our lives in light of his return, both for believers and unbelievers. This is a message for you, regardless of where you stand today. Our, our title this morning is The Evidence of Faith. 
Know this, children of God do not keep on sinning, but children of the devil do. When Jesus burst into human history, he came to destroy the work of the devil and provide a way for you and I to enter into an eternal relationship with Jesus Christ. There's no better news than that. No better news than, than, than knowing without a shadow of a doubt that Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil. He came to destroy Satan. He came to squelch sin. Notice what God's word says in 1 John chapter 3, verses 4 through 10. Everyone who makes a practice of sinning also practices lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. You know that he appeared in order to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. No one who abides in him keeps on sinning, and no one who keeps on sinning has either seen him or know him. Little children, let no one deceive you. Whoever practices righteousness is righteous, and he is righteous, as he is righteous. Whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil. For the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the work of the devil. No one, who, no one born of God makes a practice of sinning. For God's seed abides in him, and he cannot keep on sinning, because he has been born of God. By this it is evident who are the children of God and who are the children of the devil. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is the one who does not love his brother. Our message point this morning is this. You cannot sugarcoat sin. Let's pray together. Father God, I come before you this morning thanking you for this morning. Thanking you for the opportunity, Lord, just to come together this morning via our online service to open up your word and to study your word and to, and to read about how you came and dwelt among us. You came to defeat the work of the devil. Lord Jesus, we, we want to celebrate this morning what you did for us on Calvary's cross. And Father, we also pray this morning, if there is someone that is listening to this message that is yet to enter into an eternal relationship with you, that today they'll make the greatest decision that they could ever make, and that is to enter into a relationship with you, to repent of their sins, and to cry out to you to be Lord and Savior of their lives. Lord, we pray all of this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Notice our first point this morning. It is this. Call a sin what it is lawlessness. We read in verse 4 and 5, everyone who makes a practice of sinning also practices lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. You know that he appeared in order to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. Dr. J. Wilbur Chapman used to tell, a, tell of a Methodist preacher who often spoke on the subject of sin. This man meant no words. He defined sin as the abominable thing that God hates. Well, a leader in this man's congregation came up to him on one occasion and urged him to, to cease using such an ugly word. Pastor, he said, we wish you would not speak so plainly about sin. Our young people hearing you will be more likely to indulge in it. He, he said, call it something else like an inhibition or an error or a mistake or even a twist in our nature. And the pastor remarked by saying, I understand what you mean. And he retreated for a moment. He went to his office and he grabbed a bottle from his desk and, and he brought it to this man. And, and he said, in this bottle, it contains strychnine. And you can see on this label, it clearly reads poison. Would you suggest that I change this label and paste a different label on it like wintergreen? Well, this pastor made his point. You can call sin by many other names, but nonetheless, it is still a sin. You know, I once had a gentleman sit me down on the second pew 
of this church. And he sat me down and he said that he and his family were leaving the church because the message that I preached was too severe. He didn't like the fact that I called a sin a sin. He didn't like the fact that I preached the entirety of God's word. You know, I would rather preach the reality of the gospel today and see people saved from the pits of hell than be accused on the day of judgment of preaching a, a, a insufficient gospel, of preaching not the entirety of the word. John again says, everyone who makes a practice of sinning also practices lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. You know, I don't think there's a single person this morning that is listening to my voice that would disagree with the reality that you and I are living in the midst of absolute lawlessness and chaos in our country and in our world today. We see this every time we turn the television on, every time we go to the local news site online. Many of our large, large cities today are in chaos. There's still rioting going on. Destruction of property. People killing people. People beating people. Those who have been set apart to protect our streets are being defunded. In fact, most of us are aware of this, but New York City cut their police budget by $1 billion. Not $1 million, but a $1 billion, as have other cities. Not to that extreme, but they have cut their buddy budgets. New York has also disbanded, disbanded their anti-crime division. Cities have allowed people to set up their own communities within already established communities and have given them permission to police themselves, to self-government, self-govern themselves. You know, many of these communities have since been disbanded. They've since been removed or they are in the process of being so. You know why that is? It's because lawlessness does not work. Several years ago, I partnered with a former church member um, from my last church that had a prison ministry. He invited me to join him on a trip to the Texas Valley to do some work in a few of the prisons down there. He also said that there was a possibility that we would be going into Mexico to visit a prison there. Now, I was fine with going to see our Texas prisons, but I was very apprehensive about the possibility of going to one of our Mexican ones. Well, well, sure enough, we crossed the border and we traveled just a few miles and we arrived at this prison. We were gre greeted by prison guards who, who ushered um, us into this prison. Now, this prison was not like anything that I had ever seen before. It was surrounded by a, a large, um, large, tall um, brick wall. It had razor wire across the top of it. There were several armed guards outside of that prison. However, when we got into that prison, there was not a single guard inside of it. So, so I turned to the guy that I went with and I asked him, what in the world is going on? And, and, and um, he, he told me that this prison actually has two wardens. There is the fish, official warden who, who, who manages everything from outside of the prison. And then there is a self-appointed warden who is one of the prisoners inside of the prison who, who is responsible for keeping peace and order. I thought to myself, what could possibly go wrong with this? To me, that was all kinds of messed up. But what that told me also was that lawlessness does not work. Even amongst some of the most hardened criminals, laws must be established and enforced. At the root of lawlessness is sin. We read here um, that sin is the problem. In verse 4, everyone who makes a practice of sinning also practices lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. Sin is the problem. 
And sin is a big problem. It is a problem that plagues all of humanity and has plagued humanity since that first sin was committed in the garden. The very word sin means to miss the mark. In, verse, in Romans 3.23, we read this, For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. All have sinned. Not some people have sinned. Not most people have sinned. But all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And we're told in Romans 6.23 that the consequences for our sin is death. It says, For the wages of sin is death. The penalty for our sin is death. What you and I deserve because of our sin, because of our lawlessness, because we have missed God's intended mark for our life is death. The story is told of a little boy who was disciplined by his mother. The boy, after being disciplined, was so mad about his punishment that he stormed all across the house. And finally, he went into his mother's closet and he slammed the door behind him. And after a while, when, when his, his mom couldn't hear him anymore, she, she went to the closet and she opened up the door and asked the little boy, what are you doing? And the little boy responded, well, I spit on your coat, I spit on your dresses, I even spit on your shoes. And now I'm waiting for some more spit to form in my mouth so that I can spit on something else. Sin is like that. When we sin, it is like we're spitting on God and telling Him that we do not need Him. When John speaks of sin as being lawlessness, he is saying that when we sin, we are living in defiance against the law of God, a law that we often take way too lightly. You know, the false teachers of John's day did just like just that. And I would argue that we also way too often take sin too lightly. We don't consider the consequences of our sin. Sin is serious. And not to repent of sin carries with it a penalty of death for the unbeliever. But there's good news, and that is Christ is the solution. In verse 5 we read, You know that he appeared in order to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. Folks, to our God, Sin was such a serious problem and an offense that he sent Jesus to provide a way for our sins, our transgressions, our rebellions, and our defiance against him to be forgiven. He came to take away our sins. In fact, John the Baptist declared as Jesus was walking up over the horizon, he spoke these words. He said, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. You may ask this morning, what qualified Jesus to be able to forgive me of my sins? Well, first, there is the eternal qualification. He is God, and He has always been. In John 1, 1 we read, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Jesus has also, Jesus has always been, and Jesus spoke into creation all things. He not only spoke creation into being, but he also gave you and I the breath of life. That is what makes him more than qualified to come and dwell amongst us and to take away our sins. He did come and he did dwell among us. He was born of a virgin. He was 100% God and he was 100% man. John tells us in 1 John 2, 2, that he is the righteous one. John 1 John 3.3, 3, he tells us he is the pure one. In 1 John 3.5, we read that he is the sinless one. In 2 Corinthians 5.21, Paul spoke these words, For our sake he made him to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Christ, who lived a perfect life, 
went to the cross and he died on that cross for our sins. He became sin. He became a sin sacrifice. He shed his blood. He gave up his, his, his life so that you and I could enter into an eternal relationship with him. But thankfully, Jesus did not re remain in that tomb that he was buried in. He conquered death three days later, and he has provided a way through faith in him for you and I also to conquer death and to receive life. We're told in Psalm 103 that Jesus takes our sin and he removes them as far as the east is from the west and they're buried in the sea of forgetfulness. That is love. That is a picture of what love looks like. He became sin so that you and I may be made righteous, so that we could be made as he is. Notice our second point this morning. It is this. Christians do not continue to sin. In verses 6 and 7 we read, no one who abides in him keeps on sinning. No one who keeps on sinning has either seen him or known him. Little children, let no one deceive you. Whoever practices righteousness is righteous as he is righteous. You know, we have looked at this word abide for a number of weeks now. This word, remember, means to rest in or to dwell. John is telling us this morning that those who abide in Jesus, those who have received the gift of the Holy Spirit upon their lives and in their lives do not keep on sinning. Now, it is important to recognize here and to understand what John is saying. According to the verb tense that John uses here, when he writes, keeps on sinning, what he is saying is that a believer does not live a lifestyle of habitual sin. They do not continue to repeatedly commit the same sin over and over and over again. John is not saying that we are not going to sin. To say we are sinless today would be lying to ourselves. In fact, John said in 1 John 1.8, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. You and I are going to sin. As long as we are clothed in this carnal flesh, we are going to sin. However, as believers, we should not be caught in a pattern of habitual sin. A few weeks ago, I quoted um, Tony Evans. Tony Evans makes, made it abundantly clear with this statement that we are not going to be sinless as believers, but we can certainly sin less. Again, the question is not, do we sin or not? All of us sin. The question is, how do we react to our sin? How do you and I react when we sin? Are we broken over our sin and seek the forgiveness of the Lord? Or do we just go on like, 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 like nothing ever happened? John says no one who keeps on sinning has either seen him or know him. If you and I continue in a pattern of sin, then, then there's, that, that is evidence that we don't know Jesus and that we don't have a relationship with him. Notice John's instruction here. He says, avoid being deceived. Little children, let no one deceive you. You know, one of the major themes of 1 John is a warning to believers, a warning to each of us to be aware of the devil's schemes, of false teachers, of antichrist, plural, within the church, and ultimately the Antichrist that will rise to power one day. You know, folks, every single day there are believers, are, are said believers, being led astray by false teachers. I read just this week that a poll was conducted by, by, by Lifeway, a division of the Southern Baptist Convention. They said that 40% of people that were polled feared that leaders that walk away from the faith will lead others astray. Why would they lead others astray? Because oftentimes people are followers of leaders and not followers of the Lord. Leaders are going to let us down. But understand this, the Lord never will. Followers of Jesus are not deceived because they practice righteousness. We read in the latter part of verse seven, whoever practices righteousness is righteous as he is righteous. You know, the mark of a Christian is evident in this verse. 
a Christian puts into practice righteousness. They seek to be like Christ. They seek and pursue holiness and purity. They are found to be in right standing with God. If you were to die today, would you be found to be in right standing with God? You may say, how do I know if I'm in right standing with God? You've been forgiven of your sins and you've received the gift of the Holy Spirit. That is how you know if you are found righteous before God. Have you been washed in the blood of Jesus and set free from the bondage of sin and, and declared out and cried out to Jesus to be Lord and Savior of your life? If you have not done that, what is keeping you from doing that? What is keeping you this morning from stepping under the banner of God's love and covering and surrendering your life over to his Lordship? You know, our final point this morning is this. Signs of life. You know, all around us, there are signs, right? You can't help but see signs. There are signs advertising products. There are, um, there are church signs. There are school signs. There are restaurant signs. There are wear a mask sign. There, you go to, to the grocery store and there's six feet um, signs on the floor, keep six feet distance from one another. You know, if I ever come to a building without a sign, I get a little suspicious about what's going on inside of that building. How about you? You know, a, a, a person that claims to be a Christian who does not resemble a Christian would be similar to you and I going to Chick-fil-A and ordering some Jesus chicken and, and getting in our bag a quarter pounder with cheese. How would you feel if that was the case? You, you would think that's all kinds of messed up because you went there to get some Jesus chicken, but you left there with a quarter pounder with cheese. Well, a Christian resembles Christ. A Christian does not resemble the devil, right? Notice the first sign of faith. It is this, a repentant heart. In verse 8 we read, whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil. For the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the work of the devil. Make no mistake about it, sin originated with the devil. He is the author of it, he is the creator of it, he is the one that is behind all the destruction and mayhem that is in our world today. The reality is you are either a child of God, you represent Jesus and you resemble Jesus, or you are a child of the devil and you represent the devil and you represent the ways of this world. A child of God has repented of their sins and placed their faith and trust in Jesus and they've surrendered their lives unto his lordship. They practice righteousness. They pursue holiness. They walk in the spirit and they grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ on a daily basis basis, just to name a few things. However, a person that continues to sin is of the devil. Notice verse um, 8. The second part says this, the reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the work of the devil. Folks, it does not get any clearer or more straightforward than this. Christ came to destroy the work of the devil. To destroy the work that was birthed by Satan within the heart of man in the Garden of Eden. To destroy Satan and to provide a way for you and I to be forgiven of our sins. Since humanity's fall in the garden, sin has entered the heart of every man, every woman, and every child. Every person will either die to their sin or they're going to die in their sin as a sinner. You know, on Calvary's Hill, there were three people that were crucified some 2,000 years ago. There was Jesus, the righteous one, the Son of God, who, who died for us. And on either side of him died two criminals. One of those criminals turned to Jesus from the cross, and he denied him. He denied that Jesus was who he claimed to be. The other criminal turned to Jesus in belief 
and asked him, remember me today in paradise. For the criminal who cursed the work of Christ, he died in his sin and will spend eternity separated from God because of his unbelief. The other criminal will dwell with the Lord for all of eternity because he died to his sin. Which of these men represents you this morning? Have you repented of your sins and died to your sins? Or will you die as sinners' death and spend eternity separated from God in a real place called hell? Notice the next sign, a changed heart. A changed heart is evidence of a, 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 in the life of a believer. In verse 9 we read, No one born of God makes a practice of sinning. For God's seed abides in him and he cannot keep on sinning because he has been born of God. A sign of unbelief is continuing in a pattern of sinfulness. A child of the devil continues to sin. A child of God though does not continue to habitually sin. In fact, we are told here that a believer cannot continue to sin. Why? Because the Holy Spirit is in us. The Word of God has been implanted within our hearts and in our lives. And we were given a new nature at the moment of our salvation. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. A person that has the very nature of God in them is not a person that is able to habitually sin because this new nature in them abhors sin, hates sin, despises sin. This new nature was victorious over sin. And if you and I continue to habitually sin, then we need to ask ourselves, are we indeed followers of Jesus? If you continue to sin over and over and over the same sin, you have to ask yourself, are you really a Christian? Notice a repentant, changed heart is a loving heart. In verse 10 we read, By this it is evident who are the children of God and who are the children of the devil. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is the one who does not love his brother. You know, next week we're going to spend a great deal of time talking about love. But John makes it clear here this morning that there are two clear evidences of one's faith. That is righteousness and love. He is saying here that you can't have one without the other. He is also saying that both give evidence of one's faith in Jesus. If you are found to be in right standing with God, then guess what? You are going to have a love for others and a love for your neighbor. If you don't love your neighbor, if you don't pursue righteousness, then there's a very, very good chance this morning that you are not a follower of Jesus. There's a very, very good chance this morning that if you were to die, you would spend eternity separated from Jesus in a real place called hell. But it doesn't have to be like that. If you would repent of your sit, sins this morning and, and admit that, that your sin is... Is, is, is a picture of lawlessness, that your sin goes against God's holy standard for our lives and say, Lord, forgive me for those sins. You repent of them and you turn from them and you surrender your life over to Jesus and step under the banner of his, of his love for you and acknowledge him to be Lord and Savior of your life. The Bible makes it clear that you will be saved. If you haven't done that this morning, I want to invite you to do that. Let's pray together. Father God, we come before you this morning acknowledging that at one point, all of us have fallen short of your glory. All of us have sinned. All of us have missed the mark. And because of that, what we deserve is death. But Lord, you showed us love by coming and dwelling among us and living a perfect life and going to the cross and dying for us and shedding your blood for us and providing a way for us to enter into an eternal relationship with you through faith. 
If we would cry out to you to be Lord and Savior of our lives, the Bible says that we shall be saved. So, Father, if there is someone listening this morning that has not repented of their sins and cried out to you to be Lord and Savior of their lives, I pray this morning that they will do that very thing. Lord, you are loving, and you so loved the world that you came and dwelt amongst us. I pray that everyone listening to my voice this morning recognizes that. And if there's someone that doesn't know you, that today they will come to know you. For it's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. In closing this morning, you and I either live in rebellion against God or we have been radically transformed by him. Which represents you this morning. If you don't know Jesus this morning and you would like to know Jesus... And ask him to forgive you of your sins and make a commitment that you're going to live your life for him and not for this world. Call me. Email me. I'd love to share with you more about how you can walk with Jesus, how you can be a follower of Jesus. You know, in Romans 6, 23, I quoted just a second ago, it says, the wages of sin is death. But know what it says next. It says, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. The Lord wants to provide you with a free gift this morning, and that is eternal life. If you don't know Jesus, come to know him. Believer, let's live righteously. Let's live purely. Let's not continually, habitually sin, but let's live our lives sold out for Jesus and love our neighbor and reach out to them in love and share the good news of salvation with them. Praying for you. Have a great day, have a blessed week, and let's live our lives for Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus. There is power name of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus. To break every chain, break every chain, break every chain. There is power
Thank you for being with us today. We hope that your week will be wonderful as you walk through the blessed name of Jesus. Have a great week.